Hi, welcome to Brady's Blunders, where I usually show you the mistakes from my games, but not today. No, today I want to talk about AlphaGo. It's back and better than ever. As I'm sure uh, most of you know, uh, AlphaGo played 60 games against the world's top pros over, over the New Year's holiday. And uh, it didn't just play 60 games, it won 60 games against the top pros. And it was really amazing. And uh, I've been going through the games, and one of the things I was wondering as I went through these games is, is this... I mean, if pro games are a little bit over my head, then surely I won't understand the games of AlphaGo because they'll be, I mean, it's over their head. And uh, and I, I didn't know if I'd be able to get anything by looking at the games. And I've come to the conclusion that it's just the opposite. I actually think it's easier to understand AlphaGo's games than it is contemporary pro games. I know that sounds like heresy, you know, but let me explain why. And the reason is, is actually the nature of contemporary professional Go is extremely fighting oriented. And if you watch the videos of Young Wang Kim with you know Andrew Jackson, they they talk about and joke about when will the when will the first crosscut come? And contemporary Go is so unyielding, and neither side is willing to compromise that inevitably if it devolves into a fight, and that fight has been coming earlier and earlier and earlier in the game. And fights are frankly hard to understand. Uh, the pros can read tons better than me, and um, and and therefore my trying to understand what they're reading 15, 20 moves down the line is difficult. And you know maybe they'll place a knight's move instead of a one one space jump, and I'm not necessarily going to be able to figure out why on my own. Now, if I go ahead and watch a video of Myung Wan, and he'll say, "Oh, well, knight's move is proper here because," and then he'll show a variation. Well then I get it, then I can get it, but I couldn't do that on my own. And that's why commentaries of professional games are so important to me. But I feel that as, as you watch AlphaGo, um, you kind of just get it. I mean, the moves just make sense without someone telling you why. Uh, now, maybe not on the first go around, but when you see the repercussions of the first go around and you go back, then all of a sudden the moves start to make sense. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to be able to play like AlphaGo, you know, in all kinds of fifth and seventh line moves, and they're, I'm going to be able to make, make them work harmoniously with the rest of the board, but I think it's worth trying to learn from AlphaGo. And one of the curious things that's happened on the internet is people are begging for professional commentary. Uh, and yeah, I want to see professional commentary too. But what I'm saying is you don't have to wait. Go ahead and play through the games yourself. Put the stones on the board. And I think I think you can feel the power of AlphaGo's moves. All right. Uh, now I could spend a lot of time talking about why I think AlphaGo is great and what makes it great, but it'll be more interesting to look at a couple games. And, and actually, I want to prove a point. Uh, with these games, the two that I selected today. And the point is that one of the things that's most fun about AlphaGo to me is um, it asks questions of its opponents. And it doesn't matter what their opponent answers. They're wrong. AlphaGo just keeps saying, oh, yeah, okay, you make your decision, but it was wrong. And I feel like, uh, I feel like, AlphaGo puts the strongest pros in the world in the same kind of position that strong players can put me in. You know, it just bends you around and says, wherever you play, it's not going to be correct. And that's what I want to show. Um, all right, enough chat, enough chat. Let's get into it. Okay, so the first game I want to review is that of Yu Ji Ying. And I, I believe she's the consensus number one woman player in the world. Um, and she doesn't just win international women's tournaments. She's thrashed a lot of the strongest men in the world in, in major tournaments. Uh, and she's a force on the go board. Uh, and I found this game to be absolutely fascinating. Okay, so uh, she's playing white and she played here. Now, it's interesting because if she played here, which a lot of opponents did, pretty certain AlphaGo would have played this. And I suspect that this is going to be known as the AlphaGo Fuseki, uh, or something to that effect. Uh, it's a, a much more unusual opening. But because uh, Yuji Yang played this stone, 
Um, one of the things that we'll see is when white plays low like this, AlphaGo tends to play a large knight's move. So it's still a pretty normal looking opening. Uh, and one of the cool things about looking at these AlphaGo games is it uh, there are places where it completely disagrees with what modern Go players play, and then other places where it seems to almost confirm it. And this is a good example. Like um, in traditional Go theory, the idea of a pincer here would make a lot of sense because it would serve two purposes. It would be both an extension from one's corner as well as a, a pincer on the stone, uh, putting pressure on it. So serving two purposes is good and, uh, and it would make a lot of sense. But in modern Go, most uh, professionals seem to back off. And I, and I think the idea is being is here, I'm you know, laying claim to most of a corner and I'm getting sent that. And uh, AlphaGo played the same way, so I guess it agrees. Well, that's kind of cool to see that that's. I don't. I don't want to say correct, but at least AlphaGo agrees with that approach and does it very frequently. And this is another feature that we see of AlphaGo: um, is it played a low approach to the three-four stone. Now, I think most uh, Go players, professional Go players, would play a high move. Uh, hell, I would play a high move. Although my reason would be completely different. You know, the reason I would play this is because uh, the, the variations are, are kind of easier and I prefer to play moves that I understand. Uh, I, I'm, I'm certain that that's not why pros play it, but that's why I would play it. But also pros have really uh, tend to do the high approach, but not AlphaGo. Uh, overwhelmingly, uh, when approaching the 3-4 stone, AlphaGo tends to approach low. And of course, that invites the pincer. Uh, and then we get to another trend of AlphaGo, which is whether it's using, um, you know, a knight's move or uh, some form of counter pincer or the Taisha. Uh, when pincered, AlphaGo really likes to push this stone down. And uh, time and time again, we see the same concept. So here, and, and this game was no different. Um, and then white pushed to here and black tanukied, and we get to yet another theme of AlphaGo, which is the you know after he pushes down, he counter pincers. So this is the approach AlphaGo takes game after game after game. So when you're looking at the games, look for this, uh, and this is the yeah, an AlphaGo style, if you will. And I think it's kind of funny. Um, I don't know if you guys have read the comic or, or seen the movie for Watchmen, but one of the characters gets you know thrown in jail. Uh, with a whole bunch of people who really hate him, and uh, and they're kind of gleeful that now they're going to get to mess with him. And he says, "No, you don't understand. You know, yeah, I'm not locked in here with you. You are locked in here with me." And I kind of think that's AlphaGo's ad attitude. That when when the opponent plays the pincer, AlphaGo says, "No, no, you don't understand. You think you're pincering me, but I'm going to build a wall, and it's me that's pincering you." And I don't know. Okay. Uh, it's just kind of fun. Uh, so, but still, all seems quite reasonable. White comes out. The attack's not that strong. Uh, black makes a base. Uh, white uh, strengthens herself. And black says, okay, no, I'm cool here. Uh, just taking the territory. And then white covers. And this looks all very normal. Uh, so there's nothing inhuman about the game so far. Now, the next move is interesting because uh, uh, other people who continued locally have played here or here, for the most part, as black. But black doesn't. Black plays here. And uh, once you see the move, I think it's, it's, it's pretty clear and, and pretty cool. This is breaking the dog's face is what this uh, move is called. And I'm sure most of you know that, but let me explain for those who don't. Uh, if black doesn't play here, say he plays somewhere else, and then white plays here, this shape is called the dog's face, right? Two eyes and the nose, and this is classic good shape. It does two things. Number one, it's hard to cut, and number two, it builds eye shape. So this is somewhere that white may want to play eventually, you know, if, if, even if it might be too soon now. But when black plays here, uh, black says, no, you don't have eye shape, and furthermore, I can cut your stones. So this breaking the dog's face is a pretty nice concept that AlphaGo shows us from the very beginning. Okay, so white defends, so does black, 
and white then uh, again white defends make sure that it's connected and black backs off and we come to a key point of the game and there's three areas of interest now for white to play in one of which is um, this group it's not weak but it's not super strong and it's not super functional either um, and uh, so maybe white would want to think about helping this group and as you can see uh, everyone would think about invading right here if they were black so this white group is vulnerable although it's a well-known shape and then finally these two stones lined up like this is somewhat unnatural um, uh, black left it lined up to play this pincer right here uh, but whoever goes next in the area will get a big advantage and so rather than defending either of these groups that's where white chose to play uh, and the idea is this, by playing this Hane, uh, it weakens this group uh, and it separates this group from this group over here. And so indirectly, it weakens this group as well. So it's hard for me to say that there's anything wrong with this move at all, right? Um, and I mean, plus it also makes points. So, you know, just all around, it's, it's doing three things. It's hard to argue. But AlphaGo said, okay, well, that's your choice, huh? Hmm. I don't, uh, I don't think it was a good choice. And black played here. And so what this move does is, well, number one is it works well with this stone, starts to build the top very nicely, but it also makes it so that white won't be able to, to make eyes in the corner and makes this whole group a little bit more floaty, a little bit more vulnerable. Um, so now... If it was me, I would go ahead and probably answer, right? Play something like this and then maybe jump out. And I would say, well, if I'm vulnerable, I need to make myself you know, less vulnerable. But that would give AlphaGo the first move over here. And that can't be good for, for white, giving black the first move in both areas. Uh, so uh, that's not what white did. And instead, white said, all right, let me help this group over here. If you're going to put pressure on this one, let me make sure you can't also put too much pressure on this one. So that makes total sense. Uh, AlphaGo peeped, answer, and then peep again. And here's where we get to a very interesting point. Uh, I don't, you know, my understanding is that pros really don't like playing moves just in answer that don't really do anything other than connect, right? Here, White is making a very stick-like figure um, that isn't, isn't taking territory, you know, it isn't making points, it isn't attacking anything, and so it's kind of annoyed to keep getting forced. And here you've got black taking points on both sides. So I, I, I completely understand why white would say, no, 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 I don't like this, I must resist, and let me play here. Let me offer a trade. And AlphaGo did a few million simulations in its head and said, okay, I'll, I'll take that trade. Uh, and uh, uh, Yu Zhiying uh, made a move here, and AlphaGo came out and said, no, 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 no way I'm letting you connect. Uh, and so now uh, White had a choice, and it's I can either start running with this and hope I live, but the problem is, uh, you know, if White runs with this, even if she lives in Gote, then Black can come back and connect here. So White, you know, the, White offered the trade. White needs to come back and say, okay, now we'll make that trade. That, uh, and so I hope that makes sense. This is, this is kind of spirit. This is, you know, I offered the trade. Well, I better make the trade. I can't let Black have everything. And... Uh, Black def uh, AlphaGo defended his shape. Um, uh, White said, well, hey, you know, can I come out? AlphaGo said, I don't think so. And so then she protected her shape as well, and AlphaGo finished the corner. Uh, 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 Yu Zhiying uh, finished uh, the corner here uh, to make sure that these stones stayed dead. And AlphaGo descended. All right, let me play a couple more moves and then kind of tell you what I'm thinking. Uh, uh, she uh, came out off, uh, growing the lower left corner, 
and uh, uh, and black grew the top. And so here we come to an, another interesting point. And if I was playing black, I would think, hmm, I think I'm winning this game, right? My top is definitely bigger than her, a lot bigger than her corner. Plus I've got the lower right, um, and I think I'm ahead. And, you know, if I can make some noise in the middle, uh, I'm going to be in good shape. Specifically, and this is where I would go wrong, I would say, if I can live with this group, then I've got an easy game, right? I'm just going to win. And I would probably play this and, and tell White, go ahead and, um, and, and see what you can do. But this is the wrong attitude. And this is what I mean by um, we can learn from AlphaGo. And because AlphaGo didn't play a move like this, and I've spent some time trying to understand it. The problem with the move like this is I just said, I think I'm ahead. And then I said, now let me play a move that if it lives, I think I'll win, right? So all of a sudden I've come from a position where mentally I'm ahead to now I'm needing to survive. And, um, and that's just totally incorrect way to play this game. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, all white needs to do is play some outside stones, right? Surround me. Even if I live with a couple of points, then because white controls the outside, white will be able to invade deeper into the top, maybe take away the corner, and maybe steal this win. All because I was I would think about this the wrong way. And instead, AlphaGo goes, no, 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 let me show you the right way to think about it. And that's to play this, um, a move like this. And so this is two things. It says, White, if you really want to you know, eat those stones, you can do it. But while you are eating those stones, I'm going to start growing the top side even a little bit more uh, and make sure you don't get too much in the middle. Um, and, uh, but if you decide that... Uh, so White looked at this and said, well, I can't let Black grow the top even more. And she jumped in. Alphago said, oh, okay, you're going to keep me from getting points over there. That's fine. I'll play a move that reduces your left side, so you're getting less points as well. Um, and she jumped over here, and Alphago go, well, yeah, all right, no, I need to connect. And she played here, and Alphago said, no, 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 I'll make sure that that corner is fully dead. And so Yu Ji Ying is, is making a nice light shape, it seems, while reducing black. Uh, and um, takes Sente to come over here. And once again, Black does its assessment and says, right, I think I'm fine in this game, so let me just make sure my corner's okay. Um, and then White says, all right, look, I'm growing, I'm growing my uh, right-hand side. And Alpha goes like, yeah, uh, you are, but you grow the right side and I'll reduce your left. And look, Oh, all of a sudden, I've revived these five stones. <coughs> so you go ahead and grow yours. I'll go ahead and, and shrink the other side. And White says, all right, I'm going to go ahead and secure all this territory on the left. And Alpha says, Alpha goes, says, all right, that's fine. And I'll come and reduce the right side. And it's all very natural, isn't it? Um, there's not a great deal of deep reading to understand the purpose behind Alpha Go's moves. And, and I'm learning. Right, and uh, uh, that you know the way to win the one game isn't to start another fight, another I must live type scenario, and instead gent you, you can be gentle um, when, when you've got a big lead. And I kind of showed what I want from this game. If we go all the way to the end, uh, you'll see actually that AlphaGo, in its nice and steady style, uh, was able to resecure much of the territory in the center. And White resigned. But at the point where I was at the game, it was already, you know, at least a 20-point lead for uh, Black and, you know, inside of, a, in, for, for AlphaGo, inside of 100 moves. Really impressive stuff. Um, so where did White go wrong? Well, it's hard to say. But the next game, uh, uh, AlphaGo's human opponent uh, had some theories. So let's take a look at it. So Feng Tingyu is another really strong player. Uh, he's won international tournaments, uh, tournaments uh, and rated you know around the top 20 in the world on GoRatings.org. Uh, so again, super strong. 
And he clearly, and, and this game was played two days after the prior, right? Uh, she played on the 29th of January, and Feng uh, Ting Yu is playing on the 31st, so New Year's Eve. And he clearly took the time to review her game and decided um, that he liked her opening. Um, and so things went wrong. So he decided to reproduce it, which is kind of cool. And AlphaGo obliged and played the same sequences as well. So here we go. AlphaGo again is black. And uh, it's all exactly the same. Uh, yeah, it was three space. Uh, so I guess I don't need to talk about all the moves, but uh, it's not until here that we get the first difference. And when uh, when uh, Yu Ying played, she played here, leaving the situation kind of unfinished, if you will. Uh, and that didn't go well for her, uh, so uh, Fang Ting Yu played a different approach and said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of finish the bottom shape so we don't have to worry about it anymore. And then the, the, the game can continue and I'll have initiative. So then black pincered and both players played exactly the same sequence as the prior game. Up to this point, when AlphaGo played here, in the prior game, he played on the star point. Now, I don't know whether AlphaGo changed just because it felt like a change or if the position of this stone somehow impacted this by one space. But I'd love to find that out someday. I don't know if we ever will. But at any rate, AlphaGo moved one stone closer. And um, now you'll remember, in the prior game, AlphaGo had the choice of which group to attack, and it chose to attack this group. So Feng Tingyu said, no. I will not allow it. I will make the choice, and I will protect this group. So now it's got somewhat of a base, and this black stone is subdued, so it's going to be very difficult for black to mount an attack on this white group. And uh, so I imagine this was the point that uh, Feng Tingyu got to and thought, okay, at this point, I think white probably has an advantage in this game. And then AlphaGo said, hmm, that's really interesting. But um, no, you're wrong and went ahead and did the obvious invasion right here. So we played through uh, the predictable sequence. And then white jumped in here. Um, and the move that AlphaGo plays next is not unheard of. Uh, I think it played like 3% of the time. But remember when I talked in, in the introduction about uh, contemporary Go being rather fighty. Uh, the, the trend right now is for black to either play here or black to play here, either of which is setting up a cut here and starting a fight, right? So the, most of the continuations that we see now instantly devolve into an ugly fight. Um, but AlphaGo didn't choose that option and instead played here and then just said, no, I'm totally content to live on the second line, uh, took a forcing move and then said, and I'm totally content to make it so that your turn uh, isn't sente against my group. And here we are. So this was AlphaGo's choice, much more peaceful. So it was at this point that AlphaGo made a move that I didn't completely understand. Uh, I feel like it's adding a stone to what's already kind of weak um, I mean, so it's it's a forcing move, but it's not one I completely understand. Um, and uh, so it took a few go-throughs before I really understood the purpose of this move. But at any rate, you know, White just says, fine, go ahead and, and play there. I'll play here, and maybe later on I'll capture that stone. Uh, and it, it seems like an especially, it seems... It seems quite possible because black goes ahead and tanukis again. I mean, I guess I would think this makes sense if black pulled back right now, but black doesn't. Alpha just leaves it. And instead, Alpha goes says, hey, you're a stick. And this is another one of the characteristics of Alpha Go's games, is it really does a good job of making its opponents make stick shapes. And stick shapes are though it's a group of stones that doesn't have eye shape and therefore can be attacked. So here we see it again. Uh, we saw it in the previous game where it attacked, it made this group into somewhat stick-shaped. Now it's making this group somewhat stick-shaped. 
and saying, what are you going to do about it, right? Uh, and, and now this stone begins to make more sense, right? Now, if it can pull back, uh, black is starting to make a whole lot of points, you know, along the top side as it does this attack. Um, I, I thought white's response was really interesting. Uh, white played here and said basically, hey, I'm alive in the corner, and furthermore, I'm threatening a cup. All right, so now I want to do a quick question for, for the viewers. Where would you play as black? And this is how um, uh, these reviews become quite valuable. If you self-review a game, where would you play as black? Okay. Uh, if you want to think about it for longer, go ahead and pause, because I'm going to show you what I would have played. And without much thought, I'd have assumed this is the equivalent of a peep, right? If white had descended to t14, then black would answer and make eyes, but black didn't, right? Uh, I would play this. I would have treated the move like a peep and say, fine, you peep, I'm clearly alive. And But that's not what black chose to do. And instead, black played over here. So now we're getting more consistent use of this stone. But I was still astonished. It's like, wait, you're going to allow white to start a co that if you lose, you lose everything. This uh, doesn't make sense. So white agrees uh, and says, I'll start the co, and black captures. And I feel like if AlphaGo could talk right now, he would hand, he would reach into uh, Fang Tingyu's bowl and grab two stones and say, go ahead and play two of them anywhere you like. Play two in a row. Uh, because no matter where uh, Fang Tingyu played, I think AlphaGo was going to fill this co, right? And so where would I play as white? I would, I would consider this, but I still think it's too easy for black to live in the corner after, so that's probably not good enough or big enough. Uh, and white selected this move here. And it's like, well, if you're going to give me two moves in a row, that means what was your corner is now my corner. So I'm getting a lot of compensation. And AlphaGo says, yeah, you sure are, but I'm alive here. And... Uh, and now, uh, when I review the game, I think, all right, I know what I would have played, and I know what AlphaGo played, so what's different, right? Well, one obvious difference is white got a stone here, and it's white's turn. I got this move out of it, which is big, but it doesn't seem nearly as big as this. But it turns out that the stone, another stone that black got out of it was T14. And this turns out to be really important. Uh, obviously, it, it, it affects, it makes it so there's no eye here, but it actually affects the whole group, as we will see very soon. Um, so black definitely got something out of it, but I didn't see that until I went through the game a couple of times. At any rate, so white played Hana here and said, I'm going to take the corner. And now the question is, is you as black, what is your priority? I mean, do you want to save this stone or do you want to save this stone? You're, you're surely not going to save everything, right? And uh, if you're answering that question of which of these stones is more important, you're answering like I would and not like AlphaGo would. Because AlphaGo moved here, so it looks like it thinks this stone is more important. Uh, uh, white played here, uh, containing the two stones. Uh, AlphaGo cut. Um, white white Atari, and then played over here. And now we discover what AlphaGo really, really wants. And it turns out AlphaGo doesn't care about these two stones. AlphaGo doesn't care about this stone. AlphaGo doesn't care about these two stones. They're all just sacrifices. So black can get these moves here, right? This and this. Because what AlphaGo really wants is to make sure that this group is totally dead because it's huge. White smothers this stone, and you can see that um, later on, white can play here, uh, and uh, and black will give up these two stones, no problem. So these stones mean nothing to him. What it really wants to do is capture that really huge territory really efficiently. And I just think that's so cool. And I mean, it, it almost feels like, ah, I've won. But the other really interesting thing about this is now all of these black stones are influenced because what's behind it is captured. Uh, and what can black do with that influence? Uh, 
So I think White saw the same thing and really didn't like the prospect of Black pulling the stone out and capture. At least this was my initial thought of this is the reason why White's pulling the stone. Uh, in just a few minutes, I think it serves another purpose. But at any rate, this panuki is going to reduce the value of, of these center moves somewhat, increase the safety of White as well. Uh, and this is where we get to another neat move. So I mentioned that AlphaGo's games are easier to understand. There's no pro who told me the purpose of this move. It just seems pretty clear. It does two things. Number one, it gets rid of Atari from either side on this, what was a single stone, right? Which gets rid of a lot of the Anji that could help this string. But also, um, it says to White, I'm going to, if you let me move again, I'm going to kill your corner, right? If you go ahead and play somewhere else, then your corner's dead. Now, uh, again, when you go into how to review a game, the only way I know this is I played through the variations. I played it through just to make sure that, you know, a white move here or here or here or, or even here don't quite work. Once black gets here, it's dead. And if you're not sure of it yourself, I recommend you put this position on the board and prove it to yourself. If black gets to play this, white is dead. So of course, white's going to play here, right? No, white's not going to play here because uh, white knows I'm, he's losing at this point. And if he just lets the game get simple like this, it's not going to go well. And so instead of just answering black's move, white plays the really clever move right here. Now this is a shape uh, we see a lot. Once white has these three outside stones like this, uh, on that single stone, uh, white can play here because white can pull the stone out this way, uh, moving up, or or come out this way, moving. You know, so whichever whichever direction black defends, white can play the other, and the, the stone's going to be fine. But in this shape, it's actually even more clever than that. And let me show you. All right, so white played there, and black said, "All right, I'll connect." And White said, are you sure you're going to connect? Because I'm going to threaten to peep through again. And Black says, no, I'll connect. And White comes back like this. And Black says, well, let me make shape in the corner. And White says, I don't think so. And so here we are again. Uh, this is one of those shapes that, and, and one of the, the best parts about going through uh, these games is understanding the whys. What White has done here is to say, hey, guess what, Black? You're dead, at least locally. If you can't get out, your stones are dead. And so one of the good things about going through these games is if you don't see that Black is dead, for sure, put these stones on the board and prove it to yourself. Now, I'm not asking you if Black can get out. I'm saying, assuming Black cannot get out, can Black live locally? So just thinking about this corner bit, can black live? Go ahead and play it out. And if you've got a sequence in which black lives, find different moves for white because black cannot live. All right. Well, AlphaGo knows this and um, goes ahead and creates a co. So white has no choice but to accept this co. And, uh, but all I can say is the co is huge, isn't it? I mean, uh, I did sort of a preliminary count. I'm not going to tell you an absolute number because, well, I'm terrible. Um, but I think this if white wins this co, white's going to gain something like uh, 40 points. And if black wins the co, black's going to gain something like 20 points. So that, you know, it's something like a 60-point co. It's absolutely huge whoever wins this co. And so watching how it's fought out is very interesting. Uh, and strong players will understand it without thinking, but uh, for those of us who are still learning, it's, uh, yeah, it's really good stuff. So black takes first, and white's got a gigantic co-thread here, right? This white group is dead, and this white group is half dead if black gets to go next. So um, if black ignores this co-thread, he's going to lose all these stones, these stones are going to be alive, these stones are going to be completely alive. It's huge. So, of course, black answers that, right? Um, but that means it's white's turn to take the cup. And here I'm thinking, oh, man, that's like 60 points. What, what the heck can black do that, that, that is that big? 
and um, and I can't find anything. If I just look at the board, I can't find anything. And AlphaGo plays this. And if you look at it, if black gets to capture these two stones, so, you know, say white captures over here and black captures these two stones, black is going to gain something like 15 points. Um, if white protects it, white's keeping something like 15 points. So this is something like a 30-point co-threat. And then this is way bigger than that, right? So uh, as white, I would just automatically play this. And what I could tell you is this is actually what Fang Ting Yu played. And I'm, I'm sure for him it wasn't automatic. He had much more thought into it than I would have had. But, uh, um, but this is what white played. But what if white hadn't played this? What if white went ahead and answered the co-threat so black took? What co-threats does white have? Well, the best I can find, and maybe you can find better, was this, right? You spent all this time trying to kill this string, uh, so surely you want to stop me, Black. And the answer is, no, I don't think so. Because if Black just says, all right, I win the co, and then White says, yay, I'm alive. Um, the difference between this one and the first White co-threat over here is it doesn't threaten the life of, of black stones here, and it does nothing to help the corner. <coughs> so it's a fraction the size of that first co-threat. Um, so then when white plays here, black can just say, all right, fine, now I'll come back and take the corner. And uh, with the huge gain over here and the killing of this corner, the game is still really one-sided in favor of black, even though white managed to save those stones. So that co-threat is just not nearly big enough. So white's capture here instead makes total sense. The other cool thing about it is after black goes ahead and says, uh, I'll take this corner away from you, white then gets to go ahead and live in the corner. The problem is now black can just come out here and say, yeah, okay, all that was very nice, but uh, game over. I've got too much territory. When you look from this corner all the way up to here, I've heard Chinese people refer to this sort of shape as an airport, as in this territory is big enough that you could land a 747 in it. And when you have territory like that, you're going to win the game. So the uh, game went on a few more moves after this, but uh, basically it was over at this point. White got what he wanted, he got the kill, but what Black got was even bigger. Right, so what are the conclusions? First and most important is do go through the AlphaGo games yourself. You see that um, at no point was there such deep reading that, that I couldn't figure it out, at least in these two games, uh, that I couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, the moves just make sense, more sense than, than I find in contemporary pro games. So try it yourself. Once we have all the professional commentary, fantastic. We'll learn even more. But don't, don't avoid going through the games yourself just because you think you're not good enough. And, and then the, the second point is there's going to be a whole lot of people asking what if. The primary example of that is going to be what if humans had more time. And uh, you know, everyone's saying that humanity would do a lot better. Uh, and I think it's an interesting question. And I think, yeah, if humanity had more time, they'd do better. But when I say better, it means there'd probably be less of those dramatic deaths that we saw in these games and maybe closer scores. But I doubt the final tally would be very different. Uh, and again, when, when I reviewed game four against Lee Sedal, I suggested that this may be the last time that humanity defeats the top AI. And I feel stronger about that now than I did then. I think AlphaGo has gotten significantly stronger. Anyway, let me come back to the what ifs. The other part about the what ifs is, is people are going to look at some of these games and say, well, what if White had played a different move? You know, maybe they'll look at the Kujie game and say, well, what if I had played a different move? And they're going to convince themselves that they have the right answer. And to me, what this game shows is that um, you may think you have the right answer, but you haven't heard AlphaGo's response. Uh, I'm really happy that Feng Ting Yu went ahead and played this game and played almost the same game as his predecessor because that's exactly what he was doing. He was playing the what if game. He's saying, all right. 
What if I settle the bottom, get in, get to make the decision on top as to which group to defend, and I'll go ahead and defend it, uh, and the game should be better because I like White's opening. And AlphaGo said, well, you know, what if? That, that's a good what if, but no, I'm going to punish you over here instead. And the result was very similar, a really one-sided game. So be very skeptical of the what ifs that you hear. Anyway. Uh, I think I'm going to do more. If you have uh, feedback on what you'd like to see, let me know, and I will definitely take it into account. Thanks for watching. See you next time.